photo. <laughs> yeah, we live. Yeah. All right, that looks pretty good to me. Well, let's get let's get underway. Um, g'day and welcome. To everybody that is tuning in, whether it be via Zoom, whether it be via YouTube, uh, the oakbarrel.com slash live, or most likely probably facebook.com slash oakbarrel, um, to get a, another instalment uh, of um, these virtual events, these virtual tastings, virtual wine tastings that we um, have been running um, almost weekly, or almost certainly weekly, for, for the last sort of six to seven months here. Um, for those of you that, that they don't know me, my name is Joe Perry. I'm the, the wine buyer here at the Oak Barrel. I'm responsible for all of the good and bad decisions that are made at the Oak Barrel's wine department. <laughs> um, thankfully, tonight is a, is a very, very good decision. Um, and if you're probably not too familiar with, with, our, with our virtual tastings, um, we here at the Oak Barrel, uh, a, a fiercely independent uh, bottle store in Sydney, CBD, uh, with wine, whiskey, spirits, sake, and all the rest. We used to run lots and lots of really fun, amazing tastings in our little tasting room um, for, for several years up until uh, the unmentionable happened earlier this year where we had to take uh, our, our tastings that we loved and enjoyed and try to convert them into a virtual space and, and um, really focus on bringing what we loved and what we enjoyed the most about our tastings um, into uh, the virtual area and into your lounge rooms or your homes, wherever you may be viewing from tonight, um, to hopefully try and deliver equally as amazing uh, tasting experience uh, to, our, to our customers who supported us for so long. Um, and I've had a lot of fun doing these. Uh, lots and lots of fun, lots and lots of great wines that, that I've enjoyed. And uh, there's been a few producers here and there where, where words popped up and I thought, yeah, that would make a really, really good good Zoom tasting. That would make a great tasting. Let's, let's do it. Let's make it happen. Um, this was probably top of my list, I'd say, from about six or seven weeks ago when it got mentioned. Um, tonight we're, we're tasting through and we've, we've got the lovely Dwayne and Rebecca joining us as well. Um, we're going to taste through two wines uh, from the, the Coates series range, variety of, variety of wines. Um, that we have here in store um, and the reason I got sort of so excited about this one was I, I to, to be honest it was a maybe a, 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 a label or a producer that sort of flew under my radar for a little while and it took the very good team at St Wine to get these under my nose to push them across my desk and go Joe taste this this is this is some of the best of the, in the Adelaide Hills and I thought yeah all right let's see what it's about and I don't think that we haven't had a Coates wine on the shelf in the last 12 to 14 months. Um, I was I was pretty amazed by by what came across my desk that that morning, um, and immediately jumped on it and have immediately been impressed and have been very very proud to be able to carry uh, the range of wines here in store. Um, but before I kind of just carry on blabbling about how much I like these wines for the next <laughs> hour hour 15, um, <laughs> I do say in, in in most of these tastings that I am by far the most uh, the least sorry, least qualified person in the Zoom chat to, to speak on wine. Um, and if you ever needed any proof, um, it's that the, the, the man in the, in the picture across from me um, does have the letters MW next to his name. So um, welcome both uh, Re Rebecca and Dwayne. And uh, I would start by saying, uh, Dwayne, massive, massive congratulations. And Thank um, you. yeah, I, enormous amount of respect for, for the accomplishment that, that you achieved. Great. Yeah, the uh, the MW was, uh, I guess, the the last qualification on the trio I really wanted, which was Master of Enology, which is a university degree in winemaking. Then after that, um, after years of um, sitting in business-related meetings where someone said to me, if you only had an MBA, you'd understand. And uh, that was like a, that was like a, rag to a, red, a red, red rag to a bull. So I did the MBA and finished that in 2008. And... Um, then just finished the final component of the uh, mission to the Institute of Masters of Wine uh, and had that very good news on the 29th of uh, September after a, uh, August I should say, after a, uh, quite a long uh, dissertation process getting a, a research project into the Institute. It's always a little bit difficult when you're trying to run a winery and uh, we bottle everything in-house, we make everything in-house, we sales and marketing, all in-house, plus um, my partner Beck, she... Um, 
she looks after the food side of things at Celador on Sundays as well. So effectively, we have a restaurant at Celador on Sundays too. So between all of that, it's um, spare time, not a lot of it. So uh, getting a dissertation done on the side, which was, was quite a bit of work, has taken me um, a little more time than I originally anticipated. No, so, but thank you. Thank, thank you. you for the uh, congratulations. It's, uh, it's, it's something I can tick off and uh, go, whew, don't have to worry about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I was, um, I was very, very uh, excited when I, I saw the news come through. Um, and I definitely have a, a bunch of questions to, to ask about that. Yeah, uh, totally. but, but before we probably mm -hmm. get into all that sort of nitty gritty and that kind of thing, um, the, oh, could you tell us a little bit about the, the Coates label and then sort of, I mean, your, your experiences in the wine industry and how it all yeah. came together? Well, for, for me, um, the Coates label came about and our, our first vintage was 2003. And that was our organically grown Shiraz out of McLaren Vale. So the brand started with McLaren Vale originally. I'd say now we're more so known as a Hills producer, mm -hmm. but we did start with McLaren Vale. The 80, 80 percent now, yeah. I reckon, from the Hills. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's jumped quite considerably. Quite considerably, yeah. To, that to where we were. Um, and in 2002, I've been working in the Rhone Valley uh, with a very, very zany guy called uh, Francois Villard, who made amazing wines out of uh, the Cote Roti Shiraz, uh, Saint Joseph Shiraz, and also Condrio Appellation, which is Viognier. And uh, he was just such an inspirational guy that when I got back to Australia, I decided I'd just have to make my own wines in my own style. I was working for other brands. And so that was really the inception of Coates Wines was uh, in 2003 to have a bit of a brand which was really pushing experimental styles and um, pushing the envelope in the sense that it's not something I could do for someone else because what we're doing is a little bit risky. So natural yeast fermentations, unfined, unfiltered. Um, we originally started using Russian oak back in 2003. Occasionally we still use it. And um, the brand originally was all organic vineyards. So we moved away from that with time. But uh, for, for that period of time in, in the Australian wine industry, that was fairly, fairly radical, the way I was making my wines. And um, it went from being a little bit of a part-time passion project on the side, bit of an experimentation, to three or four years down the track, uh, the day job's been resigned from, and then I'm um, really just focusing more and more on coats and growing, growing the coats side of... Um, of the business and that was uh, probably a very very good decision um you know a lot of doubts and um yeah, you, well, you know always, left turns right turns down that. the wrong street <laughs> along the way as, as yeah. you had in business and um also, the wine industry is no different yeah it's also gone from that one product back Absolutely, in 2003 yeah. the the shiraz that was organic um to where we are now which is about 20, 20 different wines or 20 mm -hmm. oh, it's about 20. 6, 27 uh, if you go with museum stock as well it's, it's quite substantial, complete yes. wine geek, mm -hmm. <laughs> which that, is good. And that's <laughs> always been part of the brief of Coates is, uh, you know, it's not a business run by accountants. It's run by a winemaker, effectively. And the kind of the way we make our wines, they're wines really made for someone who has a world exposure wines, which is through the MW program, and as a winemaker. So they're really wines made for winemakers to appreciate. Um, and I hope the public likes them as well. <laughs> but they're really, really sort of focused on what I, what I love, the styles I love and the, the techniques I like to yeah. experiment with in the, uh, in the winery. And yeah. um, They're all treated like children. They are. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone has the same story. Occasionally um, we have naughty children. but <laughs> Sometimes they're naughty. We have well-behaved ones during vintage sometimes. And some children are not so um, easy to work with. But, um, um, yeah, so okay. the, I guess the bottom line of all that is... Um, this is not really a commercial winery in the sense that, um, you know, we're not big on sales and marketing. We're really big on um, spending our time and money on the product. And uh, that's probably why so many people haven't heard of us is sales and marketing side of it is really a blind side to this business. Yeah. We're just really concentrated on making great wines and um, taking a slow, slow way about uh, a, the winemaking. It's a yeah. very slow, considered old school way of making wine and just trying to get it right and getting it right first well. time yeah. yeah so i guess the um we've got so many different varieties but when doing saying we're small i think uh on average we're sort of doing about two and a half to three thousand at the most mm -hmm. dozen a year and across that many lines so the um so the riesling that where's the camera um, <laughs> sorry, the riesling you're cameras. tasting um, the riesling that you're actually tasting that particular year we only actually made 60 cases yeah. 
so it's um it's really quite small production with some things up yeah. to some of the some of the lines are a little bit bigger but yeah we just want to make sure we get everything everything to make, right to, to make one pellet of riesling is not really economically viable viable just want to make riesling in the range because i love riesling and i you know from one <laughs> I, probably, is, I, I really want to make riesling and there's been an argument going on for so many years about Brain wants to make Riesling, so like, you oh, can't. Okay. Well, I've got this really nice pork pop dish and a Riesling would go so well with it, honey. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, yes. it's probably rather than pure economics. <laughs> but I, do know, um, I do know that there's certainly a, a few keen uh, home chefs in the room that mm -hmm. are, are going to thrive off the uh, the food wine pa uh, pairing advice <laughs> th throughout, which is, which is quite good. <laughs> And uh, Beck, Beck's background is a chef and uh, she still works a couple of days a week at 2KW in Adelaide, which if you've been to Adelaide, you've probably been to 2KW, one of the best restaurants in Adelaide. And uh, mm. apart from that, the, the resume is um, uh, pretty exceptional in, in Adelaide terms of where she's worked and even a little bit of a stint, small stint at Salt in Tokyo and um, where yeah, else have you worked? Singapore. Singapore. Well. That's yeah. real on the board. All over the place. Oh, sorry, no, that was... Um, I just like eating Shanghai. food a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so food and wine in our household is um it's a pretty serious sort of thing <laughs> no we also like having a bit of fun but we certainly don't go hungry on this so <laughs> <laughs> well, to give you an idea we're not we're not snobs it's, it's i was out shopping the other day and i was getting asian um produce for this weekend and i saw these pack of noodles called angry chicken oh man <laughs> so good oh my god they're so hot <laughs> and i thought i had to buy them for the just with the, uh, the sort of chicken logo on the, uh, which effectively two-minute noodles. So we sort of we tried those last night and... Um, wow, they're God. the hottest noodle, two-minute noodles I've wow. ever had in my life. <laughs> I'd sort of had to try them. And um, so I opened up this sachet and it was about this big, about that long, probably, I don't know how much fluid was in it. I was thinking, is that pure chilli oil? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it is. And it's, yeah, wow. It was, yeah, bring tears to the eyes. Oh, hot. yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we're not necessarily snobby about no. what we drink, but uh, we try to have fun. Yeah, and, um, everything's fair game. Everything's really. fair game. <laughs> so is, is there a Coates wine in the in the works to, to match that uh, two-minute noodles dish? Yeah, I think it's called beer. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah, we might get a cow. Milk. <laughs> milk. <laughs> I had a really big glass of milk after that. My mouth just would stop burning for, for about Call half it, an um, hour. Like Bessie juice. Yeah. <laughs> But mine too, Sparkling Red is is one of the best uh, wines to have with... Yeah, actually um, it does work, yeah. With, uh, anything that, spicy. that sugar, sugar yeah. in there does work really well. <laughs> Especially with Vietnamese, it's awesome. <laughs> that's, a, that's an awesome pairing. I never, never thought of that before. Mm -hmm. um, and she, anything with Szechuan pepper as well and Sparkling Red, you've just got to give it, mm -hmm. give it a go. One of my mm -hmm. favourite um, dishes or combos used to be... Um, it was a regular lunch thing I did for my father was... A bowl of Rockford Black Shiraz and Szechuan duck noodles. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Match made in heaven. Yep. So hot, spicy Szechuan and sparkling Shiraz. Yep. It works. I'm going to have to give that a go. <laughs> um, I, I know that you, you alluded to uh, Francois Villard in, in the Northern Rhone there. Yep. Um, uh, but you also have a bit of uh, winemaking experience in, in Burgundy, um, but yep. also the Duro as well. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, so as well. Always been a uh, an absolute passion of mine. So the Duro was a case of I've been bothering um, David Gamarin, who was the chief winemaker for uh, the group that owns Taylor's, Fonseca, Delaforce, and Croft for a number of years. Um, and every time he said, "Look, we're too busy," and eventually, "Are you going to give up?" No. Nope. So then she said, come on over, 2003, I came over and worked with um, David at one of the wineries there and uh, vintage ports and ports is something I love as well. It's um, not a, um, I guess, a, an in favour or fashionable part of the industry, but it's a, an amazing part of the industry to be involved in the crafting of great vintage port. Um, one of the hardest wines in the world to make and uh, to use a slightly sexist term, but I would call it the king of all wines. It is the hardest wine to get right. Um, and in terms of longevity, a couple of weeks ago, or was that last Saturday? Yeah, last uh, Saturday. Yeah, it was. Yeah. A friend of mine opened a 1962 Fonseca, which um, predates me by quite a number of years, and it was still drinking 
absolutely fantastic route. Just a gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous wine at. Um, I think it still had slight red. Yeah, in, what's that? 50, 58 too. years of age and yeah. still drinking fantastically mm. well. So they're for me, really, vintage really ports cool. are one of the world's greatest wines. So that was hence the um, the desire to go and work and learn um, under David Gamarins. And um, one of the things that drove that was ha a having seen his ports, and then as a younger man when I first started in the, in the wine game. I remember one spectator do their top 100 wines of the year. Probably nothing out of that that important anymore. Um, they've probably lost a bit of influence in the wine world. But back then, one spectator was a be-all and end-all. And um, I think it might have been 1990, I think it was 98 or 96, two wines had achieved the perfect 100 points, and uh, which is such a rarity for someone like spectator. And uh, wine number one. Taylor's Vintage Port, 1994, made by David Gumarans. Wine number two, Fonseca, Vintage Port, 1994, made by David Gumarans. I thought, I need to work with this guy and just see what this is all about. So that was a fantastic experience to work with someone so dedicated, passionate, and uh, attention to detail was amazing. I remember being at the winery at three in the morning. I was looking out for the wines on night shift. David rocks in three in the morning. He is chipper, like absolutely beaming. And uh, isn't vintage a great time of year? You know, obviously, the, um, the English uh, side of the industry came through as English educated, really thick sort of English accent. Great time of year to be out, you know. It comes around once a year and it's just amazing and vintage is the most amazing time of the year and I've just been to the four other quinters on the way and uh, then I'll get home and maybe about 6 a.m. 6 a.m. I'll get to bed. thought, wow, there is a guy who is working nearly 24-7 and is in love with what he's doing. And that, yeah. that is such a... So much enthusiasm, enthusiasm. and excitement. And excitement well. about it's it. Kind of, yeah, it's contagious. And that rubs off. And I'm <laughs> thinking, geez, I'm a night shift and it's four hours to go to we'll finally get to have breakfast <laughs> and go home to bed. And you meet someone like that in the wine industry and that really is the lasting impression on you about um, the importance of enthusiasm and, and love and of, of the craft of what you do. Mm. Yeah. And to go back previously, Burgundy, I spent two, two vintages with a uh, domain called, which are now called Bellevue. But I also have a uh, Macon operation uh, which I looked after for two vintages in uh, one and two. And uh, that was a really, really good experience to to work in Burgundy and learn the ins and outs of how Chardonnay is made in the best Chardonnay producing place in the world and how awesome. Pinot and Gamay are made in the best Pinot and Gamay producing uh, region in the world. And that was good fun too. It was um, it was challenging at times, but um, I learned so much working with uh, with the team there. Uh, that's awesome. I mean, yeah, that, I, I, the the um, stories from the Dura are, are, are fascinating uh, for, for me, anyway. Um, just crafting those, I've, I've been lucky enough to try a few of the older older yeah. fortifieds and and ports from uh, those sorts of areas. Maybe not quite that old, but they're always that that mind blowing bottle that always you know knocks everything else off the table, which is yeah. pretty cool. Um, just feeling a few questions coming in early, but uh, Juliana mm -hmm. says uh, for for Beck there says Bravo. How did you like Luke? Um, which I think might be a Luke Manigan. Oh, Luke Manigan. Oh, yeah. uh, you... <laughs> Sorry, like Luke. Luke. Which Luke? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, he was a he was a pretty dynamic, energetic kind of guy. He has so much on his plate, though. So there was a bit of time with him. But when I was in Salt in um, Tokyo, he wasn't actually in the restaurant. For much of that because he was doing um i guess uh, the oh, what's it called now the lexus appetite for excellence program and tv shows and all sorts of different things so he's he's very good at um he's got some really good ideas with food but he was also very good at pulling people together as well <clears throat> as a um a bit of an organizer kind of person so he's got his fingers in so many pies i don't know he's he reminds me of a the, the David character that Dwight was talking about, he just gets really excited about everything. <laughs> He's got fingers in a lot of pies. Don't know whether I could be quite that. <laughs> but, you know, but some of the food that he does is really quite good. Yeah. So, no, he was, a, he was a really lovely, approachable kind of a dude for, um, yeah, for me. I met, met some really amazing chefs yeah. throughout that trip. So, yeah, it was um, really quite cool. Like Tetsuya and... Mm -hmm. Um, Kata Kong and yeah. a few other people as well yeah. through that um, that program. So that no, was good fun. Yeah, and uh, if you do have questions, uh, and I sort of start to spill off into technical jargon, speak up <laughs> because I can't help myself. I, um, 
Sorry. sometimes. Um, he, he still loses me sometimes. I went, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Just slow down. I know, it's... <laughs> Yeah. Seven years of working in the well, actually probably it's a bit longer than that. Yeah, actually, like seven years working together at the winery, working current winery, full time, yeah. pretty much at the winery. Yeah, a lot of it's osmosis, but even now it's sort of like what? <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> so I haven't yeah. got the um, the onology degree, so yeah, I just am relying on the um, the experience, time, etc. <laughs> So, yeah. um, Juliana does follow up her question and, and says, I made a broccoli and fennel soup, which is going well with the Riesling so far. Oh, um, yeah. Which might be as good a cue as any to, to pour a glass of Riesling. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That would be- Not that anybody following along actually needs a cue to pour a glass of wine. But- no. <laughs> I'd be very disappointed if everyone's sitting there going, oh, fine, I can pour a glass of wine. <laughs> 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 Ah, oh, um, just a question up there. What was your dissertation topic, which was methods of preserving freshness in open bottles of wine? So I was looking at uh, evaluating uh, Coravin, you know, the vacuum arm pumpy system, um, putting inert gas and get the cans of spray that goes into an open bottle, refrigeration and also decanting um, into a 375 ml bottle, keeping that. And, and just putting it in the fridge. And but, also, yeah, and yes. also just refrigeration at four degrees in yeah. domestic uh, fridge and... Um, so it's all done uh, in the lab as all well. under laboratory uh, conditions uh, with the help of the Australian Wine Research Institute. Um, there's some pretty um, high-end technical information in the dissertation, but the bottom line is um, Coravan was hands down the, the best method of preserving freshness. Mm. Then after that, refrigeration kind of works okay. Um, the vacuum pump vacuum pump doesn't work all didn't work all that well. It was okay for about four days, and after that, deteriorated. Um, the canned gas, like the argon gas you can buy and squirt in, that didn't work particularly well either. It was okay at four days, but by eight it was not very good. So Coravin is the, um, hands down, was was the uh, was the best method. Yeah, but chucking in, like in a home situation, if you don't have the uh, uh, Coravin system, though, mm-hmm. just the fridge. Fridge is probably the best bet. Quite well. Yeah. Or um, even when you decanted it into the smaller bottles. If you know you're not going to drink it and you only mm-hmm. really want to have half a bottle and you carefully decant it into a smaller bottle, that. And get, get, that if you get around to that in four or five days' time, the, yeah, the smaller it, bottle is. It actually uh, works quite well. So yeah. it's a cheap option. It's a cheap option, yeah. Especially for people at home. Mm-hmm. I can't even I can read that. <laughs> I just saw it. I can read it there. <laughs> what is the concept of leftover wine? Um, very good point. Very good point. Um, it's, it's something something I read about lots from uh, studies. Never seen it here. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's um, a big one. That, That's quite fascinating, actually. I, I, I I'm glad for for knowing that now as well, because when we sort of started with the um the the concept of these virtual tastings um. You know, we, we toyed around a little bit with the idea of maybe breaking down bottles into 30 mil samples, that kind of thing, yeah. mailing them out, something I didn't feel particularly comfortable with, anything yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, but also it was, uh, you know, a lot of producers wanted to taste four or five wines in one sitting. Um, and the question I got the most all the time was, well, I'm not going to drink four bottles in a night. You know, how yeah. long can I have these in the fridge for? So yeah. I think that's kind of, you know, that's really, really good to know. Yeah, and from the point of view of um, trying to preserve freshness in wine, there's two enemies. One is air. So the more air you've got in the bottle, the worse it is. And the other one's temperature. So the cooler you can keep the wine and the less exposure wear, that's really um, the two critical things unless you want to start yeah. spending you know, good money on Coragon yeah. or other systems. The colder it is, the, yeah. it just slows the process down. Yeah. So open it, minimise air contact and mm. uh, keep the wine cool. That's the best thing you can do in a domestic situation. Yeah. Uh, if you've got a Coravin, fantastic. That's the uh, that's the uh, gold standard in in preserving those wines. And what with, with a Coravin, I, I've seen um, sort of things doing the rounds on the internet and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. But people maybe give Coravin uh, half a bottle and then yep. coming. I think maybe they did the test, but they came back to it in a year's time or three yep. five mm-hmm. days, and they were, were quite confident at tasting fresh. I've not tried it for myself, yep. obviously, but uh, would you say that's that's pretty valid? We have tried that. Yeah, we, we, we did do that. Uh, we um, got a 375 mil bottle of Barolo and I took out exactly half, put it in a Vintex, so at least the temperature was controlled at about 16 degrees. And then mm-hmm. to the day, a year later, I pulled out the remaining half bottle, opened up, poured it in a glass, and it only looked like it had been opened yesterday. 
Wow. I think that's, yeah. well, that's actually, a, isn't that what happened with your results as well? It, it yeah. through it, it changes slightly yeah. and then it just holds it. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, and that could just, that could also be, you know, like because these are screw caps yeah. as well. You're and taking it off, you're putting another the um, carbon cap on that's got the little silicon filler. So it's got a very tiny amount of oxygen yeah. that transfers in there. But then once, you know, once it's on there, it's on there. So, and the rest of that gas isn't no longer, it's oxygen, it's actually argon, which is, um, where, which yeah. is uh, inert. Uh, sorry, I'm going amazing. to break the cup and I've just, I'm just kind of missing them because they're coming up pretty rapidly. <laughs> sorry, apologies. Right. Uh, we've probably got to, to um, oh, Juliana makes a, makes a point to say, um, if, if people are asking questions, you can actually flick the, uh, the two panel into panelists and attendees. That way people in the chat uh -huh. will see also. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but Jolene asks, uh, what great varieties do you think will be sustainable in the hills in the next 10 years or so? Mm -hmm. um, and then in, in the broader Australia. Um, Adelaide Hills, I think, will um, be good for Chardonnay, Pinot. Most of the classic varieties, I think, are going to be good for Adelaide Hills, plus your alternates. Um, we're seeing a slight warming up in the hills, but certainly not what we're seeing perhaps in some of the warmer parts of Australia. We're still getting, for example, 2019 was, oh, sorry, 2020 was a year will um, not be forgotten in the hills due to bushfires. But if you had fruit which wasn't smoke chain affected, which we're very lucky. The southern part of the hills wasn't affected by the uh, by the uh, smoke drift. Mm. We saw amazing acidities and beautiful fruit this year. Um, the acids are absolutely amazing natural acidity numbers. So that bodes very well moving forward. That uh, we're still going to be able to produce really really good quality fruit out of the Adelaide Hills mm. in a classic style without getting high alcohol and flabby wines, which lose their acidity, which is a result of warming temperatures. We're seeing very, very good res results in the hills. I'd say viticulture plays a bit of a part Absolutely, in that yeah. as well. So you've got to, um, you know, you can't get the vines in the hills to crop the same way as what they would in, say, McLaren Vale, Barossa or yeah. Lake Concrete because it is so much cooler. If you end up doing that, your fruit won't get, right. won't get ripe, you'll strain mm -hmm. the vines and you run into all sorts of different problems and disease issues as well. Yeah. So it's um, a lot of... <laughs> You know, good wine starts with getting getting right, good fruit as well. Much. So yeah. that's that's the first step in the um in a very long ladder. <laughs> yeah. I hope um, that question. Yeah, it's, I think um I wanted to, to touch on your your range of wines uh, mm -hmm. a, a bit later on as well. But yeah. um diving like you know head first into this riesling, yeah. Yeah. um the the nineteen um mm -hmm. just sorry, the riesling I believe everybody, everybody's yeah. got there at home. Mm -hmm. And, and just a little uh, sidetrack is most of the wines are called the something. And um, I actually had someone had a go at me in, in media <laughs> that the, the Riesling, I don't mean the Riesling as it is the only Riesling in the world. It's not the Riesling. It's just called the Riesling. Because, when we, got, <laughs> because when we got orders, everyone would say, oh, I have a case of the Syrah, a case of the Chardonnay, a case of the Pinot. And eventually we just called it the Pinot, the Syrah, and the reason yeah. and that's what everyone called them so. so i just thought i'd clear the air, air on that <laughs> one so um and the reason is um new for 2019 mm. it had been something on my radar screen for a long time to make but um we just had so many wines in the range yeah. that i decided to um just yeah. leave it be for a little while we've i've made reason yeah. for other people not my own brand but other mm. people in the past long time ago long time yeah. ago um and we always do things a little bit differently with uh, with uh, our own wines. And um, what we did with the Riesling, for example, is we bring the we brought the Riesling in. It was literally driven straight off the vineyard, straight to the winery, which is you know ten minutes between picking and um, getting yeah. it ready to go on the press. It's growing literally one hundred and fifty meters, yeah. maybe maybe two hundred meters, meters away, away from where yeah. we are. So it's it's very very yeah close. very close by. <laughs> um, and then we get the the the, uh, the grapes go into a what's called an enclosed bag press, which is a technical term for a press which is really designed for very high quality whites. We press the juice out. We don't really look at getting any pressings into the uh, juice at it's all. Inside. It's pressings being that the harder, coarser part of um, uh, the grape juice. So you start off your pressing cycle. It's very very soft and gentle in the, the initial part of when you start to press, and then as you press harder and harder, the Juice colour starts to go browner. It becomes grippy, phenolic, or, or coarse. So we really avoid those parts of it. 
And then we just let that settle in tank for a while. And then the juice goes into um, very, very old French oak reefs. And that's one way we're very different to most other producers in Australia is reasoning is normally done in stainless steel. We've um, made our reasoning in very, very old French oak reefs. I'll get around to why we did that in a minute. And then we let it go through natural yeast fermentation, which is ambient yeast in the winery. And that does take quite a long time to get started and take uh, up to two weeks to actually kick off and get started. Mm. And then we just let it ferment through to dryness. Um, I was looking at the uh, the ferment right at the tail end of the stage where it's uh, starting to look more and more like wine. And um, often, especially with cooler climate reasons, you might keep a touch residual sugar, one or two grams a litre. I thought, I don't really want to do it. So I just kept tasting it and tasting it every day. And I went, right. It's right at the point where I think it's, the balance is fantastic. Uh, we give a, a little bit of sulfur to um, kill off the yeast and protect it from oxidation. Then I checked the residual sugar level and it came through dry, about half a gram a litre, which is effectively dry. And I was pretty happy with that, that um, it ended up being uh, dry. Now, one of the reasons, just to go back one step, we um, fermented this in French oak was that um, when reason is in stainless steel, uh, it can almost have a bit of a steely character to it. And when we're working for fruit from the Adelaide Hills, which is a very, very cool climate, you have a really, really strong acid backbone. And one way of sort of softening it and giving the reasoning a bit more texture on the palate is to give it a bit of uh, fermentation in older seasoned French oak. We don't really want oak flavour. It's just the fermentation process in French oak really does give it a little bit of softness and uh, voluptuousness on the palate. Mm. Um, so there are a couple of different ways we've um, gone about producing our reason. And then I think it was only about four months in oak we looked at um, prepping up the bottle and uh, we just basically gently racked the wine out, trying to leave as much of the solids or yeast sediment behind as we can. Uh, we cold stabilise it so it doesn't go crystals in the bottle. So we keep it at minus four for about two weeks. And over that period of time, any yeast leaves or yeast sediment just slowly drops out of it and goes to the bottom of the tank. Then we rack it off into another tank and then into bottle. So that's how we're basically able to uh, bottle our, all of our white wines um, unfine and unfiltered, so we don't use filtration. But as you can see in the glass in front of you, the wine is perfectly clear. It's not cloudy. There's no sediment in the wine. And um, it's just very traditional French, European style of winemaking that we've kind of adopted or plagiarised, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, and it's just a very slow um, way of making wine. It's not a fast, quick-to-market way of doing things, but that's uh, kind of the way we, we do all our wines. It's, it's all about time, it. patience, yeah. and... Um, and just waiting for it to do yeah. its thing and just and monitoring it and controlling it every step, step of, the of the way, way as well. So it means just being really on top of hygiene and temperatures. So um, if you imagine when Dwayne was talking mm. about the, um, the wines... The, sorry, the grape juice when they're in barrels and they're fermenting. If anybody, so we've got a few foodies out there when you make bread and when your yeast in your bread is starting to multiply and it's starting to improve, your, your dough starts getting warm. Well, the same, same kind of thing Absolutely. happens with wine. So you have the native yeast that then inoculates your, um, your grape juice, which then starts chewing through the sugar and multiplying. It generates a lot of heat. And so we, if you, you notice when you're, you're drinking um, the Riesling and when you go on to the Garden of Perfume and Spice, it's got some really pretty characters in there. And so we're really careful at trying to make sure those ferments stay cool because they can really jump up in temperature. So I think in some of the tanks, if you let them go, they can get to 40, 50. No, not that, quite that hot. You can get into 30, yeah. 30 plus They're quite, hot, quite high in the 30 degrees anyway. And mm -hmm. what that does is it cooks off those really nice, beautiful, pretty notes that are in there. So with the, um, we're quite lucky where we are at night in summer. It actually cools off a lot through Kaipo to the point you have to put jackets on. Um, yep. so we very can, cold overnight. So yeah, so... Kaipo. Yeah, so we can actually put the barrels outside, wet them down, you know, save a bit of power and let the environment do what it does. And with the the steel tanks that we use for the red ferments, they actually have, I guess, like cooling jackets that are welded onto the outside of them. They work a little bit like a car radiator. Mm -hmm. If you imagine cooling, like liquid water gets pumped through them and it just removes some of the heat. So we yeah. can sort of keep it in a temperature band. But if you can imagine, it's um, there's a bit of inertia that goes on with some of those. So you've got 2,000 litres or two tonne, three mm -hmm. tonne in a ferment. You kind of have to think, well, where's this? How fast is this temperature going to go up? And you have to think, 
you know, 12 to 16 hours ahead because there's that much of a lag time with the um, pooling side of it. hope that wasn't... Yeah. yeah, we're getting a bit technical. Sorry. Right, but how, how, how we make Wait, our wine. Just drink wine. But, um, <laughs> I mean, to remove the technical side of it, what we're trying to do with our reasoning is to have something from a, from a very, very cool climate um, part of the Australian winemaking scene and trying to get something which has a great natural acid backbone, really good lime, lemon, grass flavours, and add a little bit of softs and texture to the uh, to the palate. Um, mm. I think if we just stay in the still fermented that with a with a cultured yeast strain, it'd be a bit linear, a bit angular. The acid would be sticking out, and it just wouldn't probably have either the longevity. I think this wine's going to have. Mm. I think this is going to be a uh, a twenty year riesling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I definitely think um, I. Uh, my sort of my sort of wine background started over in Europe, and I, mm. I learned the the, the the German style and the, the European style of Rieslings, and came back uh, to Australia with nothing but a love for Riesling. And yeah. I've, I've struggled, or I, I used to struggle quite a lot with with a lot of the Rieslings I saw coming out of Clare and Eden, mm. uh, which did have that very steely, very angular. Yeah, very um, note yeah, that, that you mentioned, and you know that almost like that teeth hurting kind of acid in there. Um, but I, I adore this. I think it's, it's amazing. I just think like, yeah, that, that texture, um, everyone in the, in the chat is just saying it's, um, yeah, got that, the richness, the plushness, it's sort of, I guess, allowing that the fruit to be a little bit more, uh, on its own rather yeah. than sort of stuck yeah. into a bag or something like that, yep. uh, which is very cool. Um, yeah. I just want to ask, cause, um, uh, with your, your range of wines, obviously mm -hmm. there's fruit coming from different parts of the hills or Langhorn Creek yep. or, or McCarran Vale. Mm -hmm. What uh, what was it about this Riesling vineyard that that made you that drew you towards it? I, I guess you'd say or thought, wow, that, that that's going to make this, good this is not actually one of our one of the vineyards where we're based. It's next door, mm -hmm. and um, it's actually from the K1 vineyard, uh, Hardy's or Jeff Hardy's K1. Mm -hmm. And I'd seen their wines, and um, you know, Jeff and I've been talking on and off. Like, oh, I'd really like to make a Riesling one day, and Jeff said, I'd really like for you to make a Riesling one day. <laughs> <laughs> He twisted his arm, I don't know, he went, oh, okay. And, um, <laughs> you can have a little bit. <laughs> and when, when we went around looking for reasons, yeah. obviously we just had to walk next door or invite Jeff over, have a chat and have a beer and say, Jeff, I just need a, you know, a ton of, or a couple of Nelly bins, which is just short of a ton of reasoning. And um, Jeff is great, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll, we'll hook that up for you. And um, Jeff has, uh, and the family, mind you, and also Jeff's winemaker, have been um, really supportive <laughs> of, uh, of our reasoning and uh, they, they love it themselves. It's great to see the people who grow the fruit really appreciate what we've done with their uh, with their hard work as well so it's been a, a, an added bonus been pretty cool. yeah is that the only sort of riesling vineyard that you've maybe put an eye on in, in the hills there or uh in in recent times yeah it's <laughs> it's very close i know i know the quality of the fruit coming out of uh, of that vineyard so it's been in one where we've um, that was a bit of a no-brainer for us there's a number of vineyards around the kite area which also have reason we're not that's not the only one but um being right next door in case it would be picked, Pretty driven handy. over on the, on, on the tractor, on the, on the trailer on the tractor, yeah. and then we've got it five minutes later. We love that about um, working yeah. with the local fruit. It's um, it's so fresh. It's, uh, it was only on the vine you know, 10 minutes prior to we start to load it in the press, and that's that for us is one of the critical things of um, mm. working with the vineyards we do in the hills. Yeah, um, yeah I think that, that's that's pretty much I feel like it's a luxury that, that very few have um, you know, sourcing of some incredible fruit that that close to to the winery. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing that I, I did want to touch on as well, because it's, mm -hmm. it's something that is in my my day to day discussion almost always. But yeah. um, you sort of touched on earlier at the start that this um, you know unfined, unfiltered, mm -hmm. um, little to very no addition bar, say sulfur yeah. bottling stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's very trendy at the moment. Yeah. Uh, but back when you were you were uh, talking in the early two thousands and stuff, said it was really yeah. really wacky. Um, but how was that sort of wine? I mean, you said it was like how was that sort of wine making received um, back then compared to say now, where uh, with a lot of it seems almost <laughs> not quite the norm, but it definitely seems yeah. like it, it, there's a there's a big growing trend towards that sort of thing. It certainly um, there were a few sort of late looks on people's faces when I was saying how I was making my wine like. Especially some of my friends who are also winemakers. What? <laughs> Give an indication. Even the reason recently, when I was sort of uh, just in the early stages of production last year, a great, a really good friend of mine works for Australian Wine Research, highly regarded wine scientist. 
I'm saying I've done this, I've done this, it's natural yeast and it's just going to go net and being in barrels. And it was just looking at his face, so what the hell do you think you're doing? <laughs> <laughs> and there's quite a bit of that going on in that era. Um, well, even the bottling facilities. Yeah, and we had a lot of problems with bottling. We didn't, we've got our own bottling facility, but in the early days we had to use contract facilities, which is how 95% of the That's Australian winemaking industry does it. Time. But um, the moment I said, yep, we need to bottle, but it, no filtration on bottling. They'd be this blank look of, but what? Oh, they used to freak out a bit. <laughs> yeah, they just get really like, oh, we don't know if we can do that. That just sounds too risky. And sign the waiver here that yeah. um, if anything goes wrong, it's all your fault. But um, the, yeah. these are techniques that um, small-scale European winemaking has been using for hundreds centuries. of years, centuries. Yeah. And um, yeah. as long as you're very, very um, attention to detail with hygiene, making sure everything's clean, you're watching what's going on, you're really on top of the winemaking. Mm. Um, it's not... I shouldn't say it's not risky, but you manage the risk and try to do uh, everything in your power to make sure that nothing's going to go wrong. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, to the long and the short of that is in 2003, it was what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and you've, you've sort of had the, the ability to, to watch, I mean, perhaps watch the industry change towards almost favouring that, that sort of winemaking. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Mm. It's... Um, what you get away from the bigger companies when you're looking at your smaller brands, especially Adelaide Hills and the, you know, the, the more uh, cooler climate regions, it's, uh, there's so many younger producers now who are making wines in, the, in that style. And, um, you know, we used to do a bit of contract work for, I used to do a bit of contract work for other brands. And when I went to wineries, it was just unheard of to be, you know, wanting to use natural yeast and minimal filtration, minimal filtration, but it's just such an accepted part of the industry now. And um, I guess for, the, for consumers, mm -hmm. it's, pretty cool because you've got so many more choices as well out there and yeah absolutely it's uh especially for the boutique part of the industry and to, to take one step back from that it's it's i guess some of the bigger companies you know you're sort of damn with these kind of brands I, I don't mean that denigrating that but it's some of the bigger companies can't make ones that way just due to the size they are i mean we can put our riesling in a tank and watch it settle and let it settle over two weeks and end up with a product looking like that. Mm. Penfolds want to do that with one of their larger volume wines. It's going to take, you know, these five years or something for it to settle that clear, just due to the wow. volume. It's a luxury of, of being small to be able to make wines that way. So mm. um, that's it's a great benefit of being a small producer. Once you get bigger, it's very hard to do things in that method. Just yeah, due to the, you, you just can't. And so. in our winery, it's... Um, we don't have cellar hands, it's Beck and myself. So mm -hmm. we are doing every operation. So there, we don't have cellar hands doing stuff. We don't have other people outside doing work on the wine. And that gives us the ability to have really good attention to detail control. The moment you've got cellar hands, contractors, third parties, plus volumes in the you know, hundreds of thousands of litres, you're no longer able to make wines that way. So mm -hmm. um, it, it's a bit of an um, unfortunate part of the industry that um, that can't happen for some of the bigger companies. It's really yeah. something at a smaller set at scale mm. is achievable. Yeah. All the more reason to be drinking more and more small produced boutique wine throughout Australia, I think. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a few coming through. Everybody seemed to very much enjoy, enjoy the Riesling, okay. as have I. Um, Dave asked, would be good to get some recommendations on smaller producers in, in the hills and uh, regions like the Vale, Langhorn Creek and mm -hmm. surrounding regions? Ooh, I'm a little bit out of touch because I don't know all the other new producers, but... Um, um, Jimmy's got something. Yeah, there's Golden... Uh, around the Kaipo area, yeah, we've Kaipo. got um, Golden, Golden Childs, another small producer around the Kaipo. I'm more familiar with the Kaipo region. I mean, the Basque Range area has got some really, really good producers doing natural stuff. And those guys are, are pretty well known, especially through some like Oak Barrel. They'd be very, very familiar with your customers. Gentle. Gentle Folk would be one of the good well. ones that Cody is very familiar with. Top Note. Top Note around Top the area. Around, um, where especially we are the as well. They're good. about a street away. They're sparkling. Mm -hmm. What's it called? Uh, high C. High C, sparkling. Yeah, yeah, Mecca Champlain sparkling. Yeah, that's really quite smart. It's very actually, really good. And their Shiraz is looking really good too. Yeah, um, and um, there are so many producers. So here. many producers <laughs> now. It's like, like in the thousands. It's not thousands, but I it think is. It feels wow. like it's in the thousands. There are heaps. <laughs> we're driving through McLaren Vale. We There's a okay. sign for oh, a solid oil from a brand I've never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> we're in McLaren Vale like yeah, three or four times a week. 
<laughs> yeah, so I think, I think explosion. yeah, the wine industry in South Australia is probably one of the bigger employers, yeah. I would have to say, in general, because we've got so many wine regions and they are all huge because we've got the, you know, Barossa, mm -hmm. McLaren Vale, Langholm Creek, Adelaide Hills, Clare, mm -hmm. Uh, Kinawara. Yeah, so many things on um, course, <laughs> And they're, Matt, they're, all, they're all quite large. And up the Murray as well. Yeah, once we get to yeah. Riverland. Yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it's a massive, massive industry over here. So And there are just so many like little people that are little um, wineries that are popping up all the time. And yeah, it's just, it's huge. It's huge. <laughs> but so it's, uh, it's pretty cool. From my, from my perspective, if I needed to find out who's good in the Adelaide Hills and the Clarence Vale in terms of new producers, I'd go to the oak barrel and no, I'd I'd stick something there. <laughs> <laughs> <You like> that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I feel I feel the same, but I'm I'm just working over email at the moment. But there's so like what I love the most about I think where you guys are or the hills in general is that um, it's there it seems to be this this trickle down effect of these producers uh, making very good wines, but also there might be somebody that's working for them that is yeah. learning so much and then starts making their own wines and yeah, um, yeah from being down there i'd like i just think of there's such an amazing community around there that like around the hills that that i don't see as much of in, in other australian wine mm -hmm. regions and mm -hmm. now i i know um you know sommeliers and that sort of thing working in sydney that will give up their job to go and work down in the adelaide hills yeah yeah wine experience which i think is so cool yeah, yeah. absolutely um I might actually just jump into the the Syrah as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. the, the sort of the jump in right into the red. Ooh. One of the first questions we often get asked is why Syrah and not Shiraz? And um, I guess this goes back to my uh, time working in the Rhone Valley is that um, the Rhone Valley in France is the, the home of Syrah slash Shiraz for, the, for the, the whole world. Most of the clones and uh, viticulture originate in the Rhone Valley. And uh, in the Rhone Valley, it's Syrah. In most of the US, it's Syrah. Canada, Syrah. South Africa, Syrah. New Zealand, pretty much all Syrah now. And Australia is pretty much the only country in the world that refers to this variety as Shiraz. I took the view that um, our winemaking style, which was so he leaned so heavily on my time working with Francois Villard and his techniques, it really would have to be Syrah for us. And also being a cool climate um, variety or cool climate uh, origin for this wine. So what makes it different to Shiraz perhaps is our fermentation time in tank. Often when you look at something um, out of the Brossa Valley, your typical Brossa Valley Shiraz might be about a seven day ferment and then it's pressed. We'll often run our uh, Shiraz, whether it's McLaren Bale or um, um, our Adelaide Hills Syrah. We'll often run those ferments for about uh, a month. So very cool conditions. We just let them um, ferment naturally. We're not aggressive with the way we uh, maintain the ferments. It's just cool, slow fermentation. Then we press them. Uh, and again, natural yeast ferment, which is what we do across the whole range. And uh, then once they're pressed, they go into uh, French oak. And um, we do use new French oak. Um, there is a, I guess, a couple of trains of thought now. There's a very modernist way that says you really shouldn't use new French oak for your wines, but we're a traditionalist, which is more so um, aligning ourselves with using uh, newer French oak barrels. So it's about one third new French oak in this particular wine. And uh, then it's given a minimum six to uh, one year, uh, six months to a year uh, bottle age before release. So all the production techniques we use for this wine are very much, uh, they very much lean heavily on the way the French do things. So hence why we've called our wine Syrah rather than Shiraz. And the, the name Garden of Perfume and Spice, um, this wine, uh, we already had our McLaren Bale wine called the Syrah. Then suddenly I had an Avon Hills wine, which was also Syrah. And I needed to find a new name for it. <laughs> so um, I was looking around, you, you Google search, find a name, you have brainstorming, you have this name in your head, and you Google search, and you go, bastard, someone's got that in Napa Valley. <laughs> you find another name, you go, bastard, somebody, somebody in McLaren Bar with that name. <laughs> and um, I was thinking, I was sitting there going, this bloody garden of perfume and spice thing in the glass, I can't think of a bloody name to call it. I went, oh, idiot, why don't you call Just it call the it garden that. of perfume and spice? So, um, 
that's kind of how we came up with the, the name for it. So um, the perfume side of it was, especially as a younger wine in ferment, you get a lot of lavender and really pretty florals coming off of the wine. And the spice side is, um, especially with a little bit of age, you can see that um, white pepper, black pepper, a little bit of clove and cinnamon coming through in the glass. You put, you put your nose in that glass. And that spice is really, really powerful. Mm. It's just gorgeous. It's almost like... It's um, quite distinctive yeah, in the hills region, absolutely. actually, to have that. Yeah, you don't see so much that spice in McLaren, but it's really a cool climate character where you see that uh, white pepper, cinnamon, clove spice. And um, looking at that now, it's almost like sticking those, uh, it's almost like opening a little jar of garam masala. Mm. It's almost like roasted Indian spice. And it's definitely that, you know, it, even in a small portion, it takes me back to the Northern Rhone a little bit. You know, they sort yeah. of they sing Joseph expressions, which just have that lovely like white pepper crack through it, and you know that that savory element that runs through. I think is amazing. Yeah. It's beautiful, and the the sixteen I think um, almost looks like a modernist style of Hermitage. Mm -hmm. And then when we go to seventeen, just speaking out loud about how the wines sort of change over time, seventeen being a cool year, that looks like that real modernist Saint Joseph style as well. Mm -hmm. So this wine does really lean heavily on the Northern Rhone Valley. Appellations of Co Roti, Hermitage, and San Joseph, and to it a little bit too greedy to Cro's Hermitage as well. And um, for those who are, who are sort of listening and not familiar, um, the 16 Garden of Perfume and Spice, when I say it looks Hermitage like, that's a wine that, um, you know, if you walk into a, a retailer and uh, look, ask for a good bottle of Hermitage, you're looking at about $150 for a, for a good Hermitage. So the Garden of Perfume Spice at its price point really does um, deliver a lot of uh, lot of bang for your buck. And, Lovely uh, long length. And gorgeous I guess, I guess you can kind of see with that, those, um, that gentle sort of treatment throughout its process means that there's actually, there's a lot of tannin in this, but they're silky and soft. Yeah, it's about tannin for and, this. It's mm. yeah, it's almost got like this beautiful licorice note that mm. kind of carries through in there as well. But it's nothing it's nothing that's jarring or it's just it's really complex but mm. very, very, very soft. And it's just it's a style that we can't go for because it means it's more food friendly, but they're really interesting just to you can have by themselves or with, with food, food if you if that's what you want to do. Mm. So they're um yeah, we're we're pretty happy how it turned out. So and I'd almost say we're part of a you know, there's a a movement in food for the slow food movement. I'd say we're almost the slow wine movement in the sense that I remember this wine on, on, on bottling and thinking to myself, it really needs two years of bottle before it's even approachable. And we're looking at a 2016, which is just entering a drinking window. So this wine's you know, four years old and it's only just starting to become yeah. a wine you really want to start opening. And um, that's got another 10 years uh, plus yeah. ahead of it. I suppose that's, that's the other beauty of um, making the wines in this style is that you can... You can drink them well relatively young, um, if that's what you like to drink, where they're a little bit more fruit forward. Um, but you can actually put them down as well if that's what you want to do. If you prefer older ones, they are made that you can actually put them down and they'll hold together and they'll just get more complex and soften out even more. So they're not yeah. gonna um, not gonna just fall over. I think a good good way of testing that out is if you um, pop it in the pop it in your fridge like we talked about earlier <laughs> and you look at it in a day two days three days time and if if your wine's still holding on for, for the longer it holds on it generally means you can actually keep it in the cellar for yeah, a longer as well for a good, so, uh, good yeah. period of time yeah uh, yeah I, I really like i quite like the note that uh, beck made on the the tannins there the tannin mm -hmm. structure and it's something that i, I find myself reciting uh, when speaking about uh, Hermitage or Cote Roti here in the shop mm -hmm. and immediately you want to go, these are big wines. These are huge wines. These are big, intense wines. Yeah. And that always tends to scare customers a little bit. Um, but it's not that at all. It's this, this silky elegance, but still bringing that power through it. It's in this in those regions, but also in this wine here. Um, Sorry about the noise. Just, I think we're just popping a bit of hail. I think we're getting hail here. <laughs> 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 so it's getting a bit noisy in the background. Oh, if there's, if there's noise in the background. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, um, that that mass of fine, silky tannin is something we, we try to get through our reds. And the only way we can do that is we don't add tannins, we don't use fighting agents, we just have to get the extraction right by long, gentle extraction during ferment and then by a, um, longer barrel maturation. Um, there are a lot of producers now who, um, and you've probably seen quite a few of those, who now have the 2020 reds um, in the shop. 
we need, really need the way we make our wines. We really need to get those wines into oak. For example, with the game of perfume spices, mm. about 15 months. And McLaren Val Sarah is 18 months mm. oak maturation time just to let those tannins soften naturally, yeah. just with um, you know, a natural process of very, very slow um, maturation. Mm. And then into bottle and then um, bottle age prior to release. So, mm. so it's just a very, very different, um, I guess, philosophy about how we, yeah. how we make our wines. I will, I'll just probably expand a little bit on the, the whole oak sort of side. So, yeah, 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 they're oaked, but there's oak and there's oak. And um, we use, like Dwayne was saying, we use French oak and Russian oak. Well, the, the wood is incredibly tightly grained, great for making furniture, boats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but because it is so tightly grained, it doesn't impart, a, it doesn't overtake the fruit that we're using. Mm. American oak would kind of clash with what we do because it's a little bit more upfront, whereas French oak tends to sit behind the fruit. So it's not necessarily going to be in your face. Um, Dwayne's really careful about which cooperages we use i think we use five it's roughly five about, in any given year yeah. we use um, and a selection of different barrels and cooperages and it's funny when you talk about um, oak barrels most people sort of think i oh, just buy an oak barrel but um there is many there are many brands of oak barrel in the market as uh, car brands and when you choose one particular brand as you choose a car you want to work out what series let's say for example you know, to put a, uh, I guess, an analogy is if you want to buy a BMW, you can buy one particular brand of oak that's equivalent to BMW. Very, very good quality and highly sought after. Do you want an M? Do you want a 7, a 5, a 3 or 1 series? The producers have their own um, equivalents of that in the range. And then within that, there's all the ancillaries and extras and all the other little bits and pieces you want added on to in terms of forest. We sometimes specify a particular forest we take them from, your toast levels, water bent, immersion bent. And so there's so many permutations and so combinations in oak. It is yeah. just absolutely almost, you know, so hard to uh, work your way through. So but, it's another whole world. It's, yeah. yeah. It's kind of like, um, I guess, coffee as well. Similar sort it's, of thing, yeah. You've got your different roasts, you've got your different um, areas and climate and how high they are as well and all the complexities involved with that. It depends on how far down the rabbit warren you really yeah. want to go. Um, but it's yeah, it's doing just very, very particular with um, the type of oak we use, and also how much new versus, versus second, third, fourth, second, year. third yeah. fourth year, because they all impart different things, and we don't want too much new oak. But um, mm. you know, they all sort of add different different yeah. flavors. So just very careful with the balance of what we're yeah. trying to get in there. And along the short of that whole sort of oak side trip, I just took you on. <laughs> <Sorry>. is that, <laughs> um, it's all about just getting the right balance and what's right yeah. for the fruit. And uh, we're trying to work with what works for the fruit, what works for the wine, and getting a, a result we know is going to look mm, really balanced. good in bottle yeah. down the track. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely in um, in play here with, with this wine. I think the, the oak and the fruit integration is, is incredible. Um, the balance is outstanding. And the name of the wine probably just hits the nail on the head there, really. Yeah. No, yeah. It's just a a lucky thing with me just sitting on yeah. in front of Google one day going, I can't think of a name for this thing. <laughs> um, no, this is, this is fantastic. Um, I suppose one thing like you, you, you alluded to, to aging and bottle and, and releasing when it's ready. Mm -hmm. um, you'd definitely be considered as a small boutique producer. How, how does that work with, with you guys in terms of um, holding onto stock, uh, you know, maybe making the decision to hold things before, really selling the wine um i know mm -hmm. i i have the same conversation with a lot of young producers just getting into the market that might yeah. you know in secret they'll say things like oh it needed a few more months but i just needed to get stock out and get get a bit of cash flow moving that sort of thing uh but yeah. you have obviously taken the opposite direction and waited till the wine's ready and then released it yeah that's um um a part of my um, <laughs> perfectionist kind of attitude yeah. to the way we approach our wine making I, and I'd say I'm just going to butt in. There is a good example that's probably going to come up, mm -hmm. and that was when we were looking at uh, which variety was it where one of the more recent vintages is mm -hmm. actually going to be looking more ready than the previous. Is that Cab? Yeah, I think it might be the Cabernet. Yeah. Yeah. So we might actually be coming up to uh, like in the next couple of years. There is one of the vintages Cab Cabernet just because of how the vintage went, the climate, how hot it was. Um, the younger vintage is probably going to be released for the older, um, yeah. older one. Yeah. 
um, because we think it's more approachable and it's ready, whereas the other one will actually need another year. So it's like, yeah, no, nah, we'll just flip the yeah. years around and that's just how it's going to be. That's something we're considering. We haven't sort of made the... the they haven't, haven't made the executive but decision yet. It's something sort of weird when we look at the wines by the release, but, we sort of have to make those kind of decisions. Yeah. And um, yeah. from a younger uh, producer's perspective, it's it's very difficult. You know, I, I was there, uh, you know, in my 2003, 2004, 2005, and it's very, very hard to cash flow what you're doing as a young producer. You go and buy fruit, you buy oak, you get the wine made, you bottle it. And by this stage, you're kind of going, well, that's a freaking house deposit. Um, you know, how do you how do you resolve that? And that is, you've got to get your wine out to market. Um, I guess I was lucky in the sense that when I was in that position in in those early years, in the early 2000s, I was working as a consultant winemaker. So I made the choice of we'll hold the wines back. It'll be 80 months. Our first very, 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 very first wine was McLaren Val Shiraz, organically grown McLaren Val Shiraz 2003. So I could leave that in oak for 80 months bottle it and then six months prior to uh, release in bottle before we went to market but I was working as a consultant winemaker for a number of different brands and that's how I managed to cash flow that. Mm. I was very very fortunate and it made me a little bit stubborn and a bit of perfectionist about how I wanted to do things but I certainly understand completely why some of the younger producers really need to get their wines to market early. It's um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's pretty cash flow intensive yeah, yeah. industry. Like it needs a yeah. You need to have a lot of money in reserve to be able to, to fund what you're doing. And uh, sometimes that uh, you, you look at that and you go, oh, my God, what are we doing? But um, <laughs> when you uh, taste something like that in glass, you go, well, yeah. you know, that's, that's the end result. Yeah. Well. It's rewarding mm-hmm. to get that. And um, yeah. mm-hmm. life's not about cash. It's about um, yeah. satisfaction. And, um, well, I mean, the same, thing like go, the same thing goes on in, not exactly the same, but in the um, the food industry where you get, chefs that go overseas and do stints with other people so they can learn Mm -hmm. and just you do the long slow method so you get a better result it doesn't necessarily um you don't make as much money off of it but your end result with the food it's you know it's better Mm. it's long and long and slow and delicious yeah so we hope we hope we um you guys all enjoy the wine yeah so um, another very good question that came through uh, a little while ago, but I, I sort of waited to, to ask it um, from Jolene asks, um, we consider ourselves Gen X when we talk about yep. wine with anyone that might be a millennial brackets, apologies, Joe, if you're in this category brackets, <laughs> they, don't, <laughs> they don't seem at all interested in wine in the way that we are. It seems a tough market to crack. Is this generation on your radar for marketing? Any ideas what they might be interested in when it comes to wine? Oh, well, Beck's probably Generation Y. I don't know. Am I? Yeah, you are. Yeah, okay. Maybe, maybe early, late. I'm certainly Generation maybe. X. <laughs> they're yeah. they, oh, how do you? They're interested in a lot of things. The younger generation. So we I'm going to use the people I work with actually as a bit of an That's example point, because yeah. I. I feel so old when I go to work. Oh my God, they've got so many young people there. <laughs> they think they're so old. Um, <laughs> they're in their twenties. They they sometimes aren't given as much credit as what I think they deserve. They're interested in things, but yeah, they can get swayed by passion. Uh, sorry, passion, fashion, somewhat. But when you talk people like that through what it is that you're doing, they do gain. Um, a bit more experience and I guess as as an older generation (laughs) you've got a whole lot more um, experience in trying different wines and seeing the different history whereas I think there's been so much recent change in the industry that there's a lot of new things that are happening that everybody's interested Mm -hmm. in so it does it does make marketing especially when we're not really um, huge marketing marketing people (laughs) does make things very interesting um, cause there's a lot of, yeah, it does make it tricky to be completely honest, I guess, yeah. um, there's because there's a lot of story sort of telling behind that people really want to know about different things and, um, about how they're done, why they're done, or just, you know, just a, a, a good story or a good yeah. yarn. And, um, so I don't know, like we, I guess, relatively recently being on the Instagram and we've had Facebook, not that we use it hugely. Yeah. Um, just to sort of keep people in the loop as to what we're doing and tell, a, I guess, a little bit of a story about what we yeah. are. And it seems to be a, um, people are a bit more receptive to that if they're the younger crowd. 
Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's we're, we're very it, much about the, the wine making side of it and hoping people will taste and appreciate what we're doing. Yeah. We've never been about trying to sell a lifestyle, which might be something that a lot of um, millennials and the younger generations are, are really trying to look into the lifestyle side of the wine industry, mm. which is a fantastic side of it, but that's mm. just not what we've been really uh, about in terms of um, our brand presence. We're, we're yeah. more so about make really, really good wine and uh, hopefully people will understand it and appreciate it. Yeah, and I suppose, like, even when the older generation, when they were young, they were probably experimenting and looking at a whole range of different things, which mm. is what the younger generation is now doing. And as they gain more experience, they taste more mm-hmm. things, they gain more knowledge. And then they start looking for things that they actually really do like and um, they don't get influenced quite so much. They um, they decide for themselves what they mm. want. But yeah. uh, you can only get to that point with experience and time. And um, I've, I've, I've sort of, when you look at the wine industry as well, especially when you're in the wine industry, you sort of realise that uh, uh, the wine industry is not agriculture per se. It's also very much a fashion industry in terms of what's, what people are driven to mm. drink. I guess it, it, uh, and it also is, the drinks industry in general, whether it's yeah. wine, gin, scotch, whiskeys, it's a luxury good and people are very much uh, hooked into um, the story, the brand presence and, mm. and those sort of things. And I think the younger generation, especially if you're in your very early 20s or maybe even mid-20s, you bombard with a lot of information. You try to find your way in the drinks and wine industry and it takes a little bit of time to, to sort of work out for yourself what it is you like mm. and what you don't. But that's a that's also it's a tremendous yeah exactly it's yeah. a tremendous age for experimentation and, and trying to work out what it is you love and don't and things you decide that you want to take with you for the rest of your life and some things you go well you know you are, I'm just I'm, I'm, psychedelic pictures and no, no, coming no, up no. <laughs> it's good man it's also good man bad. it's all good yeah. <laughs> but <Sorry>. um, yeah. <laughs> 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 Take me back to my hate Ashbury days. Um, um, but, you know, there's a lot of discovery to be made when you're younger about what you do and don't like and uh, there's a lot of influences and you get to try things and work out for yourself and that's, uh, that's a pretty exciting time. And um, even with wines and grape varieties and producers and parts of the world, that's, that's part of the, uh, the journey of wine is, is discovering what it is you love and, yeah. what you, what, and, and just trying new things. You know, that's yeah. the, the great really? thing about the wines. There's so much to try and so many yeah. different producers and so many different varieties. It's it's a it's a non non stop journey of discovery. I mean, yeah. you know, maybe a master of wine, but uh, my knowledge in the wine industry. You don't. You don't. Stop so learning. much to learn. You so much to learn. And the same thing in food. Yeah. So many different cuisines. So many different ways of cooking mm. things. So many different flavors. You like some things. You don't like some things. Just don't stop trying. Yeah, everything because you never know when you're going to come across something that you will actually really, really exactly. Love. We, we haven't tried broccoli and fennel soup with reason. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. You haven't even you haven't that. Oh, you're yet. so getting that tomorrow. <laughs> the uh, the Syrah was matched with the Italian pork and beef oregano meatballs in tomato ragu, oh, which yes. I can only imagine would be incredible. <laughs> Just, oh, that sounds I, pretty I need, damn good. I need an address. Yeah. <laughs> I need a drone that flies at about 800 kilometres an hour. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, we'll put oh. um, yeah, no, I think that was um, yeah, obviously a, 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 tr- a tricky question all around, but um, yeah, I think you answered very well, to be fair. <laughs> Um, Sarah's loving how the Syrah's opening up it, yeah, yeah, as well. Another one of those those things you look for in the Northern Rhone, which is just just wine, how the how they develop and uh, just, yeah. like looking at both of these wines just just after opening, even the sixteen Syrahs, yeah, like, like just getting more perfumed and more spicy. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, that lift out of the glass now is really incredible. Mm. I mean, our yes. bottle was freshly opened, and uh, looking at it now compared to even how it looked fifteen minutes ago, it's really starting to um, feel. So much more spice, and that there's a beautiful line of dark fruit through that wine as well, which is just gorgeous. Um, I, I have I have two things I want to ask mm-hmm. about, and mm-hmm. feel free to answer them in, in whichever sequence you feel fit. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's a there's a, a bunch of wines already being made. Is there mm-hmm. anything that that is particularly at the front of your mind in terms of something uh, like something new for for coats or something you really really are passionate about? Oh, I'm glad you are. Or... <laughs> yes, today. Is that today? the um the one oh, the oh, the 
Yeah, are you, are you going to keep that a secret? No, that's a secret. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Let's you'll, just, probably, you'll find about, about that name. I'll have to have you chat with my distributors about it. It might be you <laughs> Really cool. It's, um, yeah. <laughs> I left some Semillon on Ullage in Oak. Great years. It's eight years or ten? Eight, it's 2012. Oh, yeah, eight years. Yeah. So we're looking at a, a very Jura-style um, genre. Uh, wine, so uh, yeah, it uh, had a little bit of floor and um, it's certainly looking uh, pretty spectacular. So that that's something um, new and exciting. But that'll be next year. That was that's the secret pick. Sorry, oh. <laughs> that's a secret I'll get pick. my allocation in now. That's right. Uh, I suppose. Oh man, it had this really beautiful sort of Just looks toffee, like. um, but apricot kernel note going through it with a little bit of wild honey in there. It's like a it's cross between Fino and Amontillado at the moment. It looks absolutely oh, yeah. Wow. But yeah, it was, yeah. Um, but almost, it almost had a little bit of that sauternes kind of yeah, thing that, going that honey, on. Not, yeah. not the sweetness yeah. at all. Like it's, it's baked, baked nuts, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, almost really brioche. Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that that's that's probably next year, and that'll be um, often that style out of the Jura is three or four years, but we've just mm. pushed it to the extreme and gone eight, and mm. um, it went into a brand new barrel as well, uh, which you don't even see. You don't see hardly any new oak in at all. No. Anyhow, we'll get back onto. Sorry. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Can Beck keep a secret? Was... Now, now we know. Now we know. <laughs> um. But in about a month's time, we'll have a Coates Blanc de Blanc, which is going to be absolutely uh, normal. We're hoping. That'd be cool. Yeah. yeah so that'll be zero dosage. It'll be close as you can possibly get to having a um, natural um, bottle fermented mm. um, sparkling. Yeah, it's been a five five year project. Yeah, four and a half. Yeah. Four and a half. Yeah. yeah. Four and a half. Mm. Yeah. So with. Chardonnay, yep. yep, straight Chardonnay. So it was a year and a half. We, it was all natural yeast fermented in very, very old season French oak barriques. So then it was a year and a half on full yeast leaves from fermentation, then bottle fermented, and then it'll be another three years on least yeast in bottle, and then uh, disgorge zero dosage. Mm. Wow. So the extra extra mm. time in bottle yeah. does... Yeah. It builds up yeasty, toasty complexity. Um, it will still be quite a, uh, a lean, age-worthy style. I think this is one that should age for a long, long time. And uh, we're so excited because I just love champagne. And um, it'll free up some budget because I won't have to buy so much champagne. I'll be able to drink my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really so, excited about that. Yeah, so technically in Australia, you only have to um, age, nine age months. it for nine months, whether it's red or white, to say that it's method traditional or and, the, vintage. The, and vintage. vintage yeah. Whereas uh, you find the top, Champagne houses in um, France, they they do it for around the three year kind of mark, yeah. three five. And then your prestige cuvées might be five, six, seven, yeah. eight, nine. Yeah. But then you're talking to three hundred dollars a bottle. Yeah. yeah. But so, yeah, we cracked a bottle of that a year, a year ago. About a year ago, and it was yeah, it was looking pretty good. So we're, yeah, we're pretty excited. We're kind of like, oh come on, <laughs> ticking the days off on the calendar. Just in time for Christmas. <laughs> so, yeah, we're really excited about that. Um, and then the the other one I did want to ask that I, I probably more of my own personal curiosity. Yeah. But did you also make a Syrah called Shinzenbi? I do. That was a yeah. um, passion project that we did one barrel back in two thousand and twelve. So um, you've got your primary fermentation, uh, secondary, and once the which is malolactic fermentation, and once one went back in barrel after malolactic fermentation, it was only ever a gravity handle from that point on. It was the very, very best um, parcel we had out of 2012. Put in some really, really amazing quality uh, oak. And then uh, that was given 28 months maturation, all new oak. Only have a gravity handled. Um, and then we have our own bottling line. But um, when that one was bottled, that was actually gravity bottled, each bottle by hand by myself. So it was really pushing winemaking to the extreme about how far you can push it and um for those wine geeks out there are probably very very familiar with um a couple of northern rome wines uh made by the gagal uh, house called la la don la moulin and la turk and i really had those wines in sight particularly the turk inside as being the style i was trying to emulate or be influenced by and so total production was 25 dozen and uh, that's really a an in-house wine that is not really 
sold very much except to friends and family. And uh, it was really just a, a project for me to push the winemaking envelope just so far in the area of quality, minimal handling, and uh, just being as gentle with the wine as we can. And um, the name itself, Shinzen B, is a Japanese term, and it relates to Koyudo, which is the Japanese art of archery, for the Japanese archery is in a sport. It's an art form, as in a martial art. Mm. And translated, uh, Shinzen Bei is the tenant or guiding philosophy of Koyudo, which is truth, goodness, beauty. I couldn't think of a better way of describing a wine that is just absolutely been made with uh, quality in mind. Mm. And a little bit of a sidetrack on that is one of the reasons we chose that and Coyudo as the, um, I guess, the, the guiding principle is both Beck and myself, when we were not so busy with the winery, uh, have both been elite level archers and shot at Australian competition level. I've shot at world championship level and Beck's also shot at um, World Cup level for Australia. And um, unfortunately for us, um, the winery is so busy now, I could, could no longer compete. And my last truly competitive phase was probably in the lead up to 2010 Commonwealth Games when I had to um, actually pull out of the training squad because vintage arrived and I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't take a weekend off to go to the yeah, uh, Australian no, Super Sport. Yeah, <laughs> take a weekend off doing vintage, not happening. So uh, the training camps were every <laughs> second weekend. I just had to say, guys, I can't really yeah, see no, myself was, taking, yeah. taking the time off to uh, head to India for that. Mm. Yeah, so that's uh, one of our little... Um, passions in, in life is uh, yeah. true still keep in yeah, contact with the people socially yeah. and um, love to get back and shoot again someday because it's such very, a very similar to golf yeah it's a real real it's um, a, it's mental a game. it's a head game it's a real mental challenge that's so it's, it's fun and frustrating and very frustrating <laughs> too yeah gotta say <laughs> so anyone sort of visiting cellar door that might try and pull a runner you guys <laughs> Oh, we've got two amazing um, water collies. Water collies. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> such great guard dogs. Well, no, not really. They're very good at chasing leaves and random mm -hmm. imaginary characters. So. <laughs> so, yeah. so to get past the guard dogs, all you're going to do is go, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> They'll disappear and won't be seen again. <laughs> um, that is awesome. Uh, I think I, I guess I'm pretty, pretty blown away by the, the two balls of wine in front of me at the moment. So th thank you guys so much. Um, probably the last last question I'd have, and a bit of a bit of a chill one, but what what um what are you what are you drinking at home at the moment, or just in general, or, or what what's probably the most consumed style of wine in, in the household? If we we'd have to say if one style of style of wine above any other in our household, which is not it's not so much driven about what we drink at home, but it's our friends, is probably Burgundy, so okay. Pinot Noir. Uh, we've got a number of our friends, really really close friends, we've known for a long time, we're absolutely Burgundy fanatic. So uh, when we catch up with them, and they're probably the people catch up with most often drink wine with, um, we will drink Burgundy. But uh, Love Rhone Valley, you know, McLaren Vale, Adelaide Hills, we sort of, we drink pretty widely. I mean, last night was uh, Fleurio um, Beaujolais because we're looking at Gamay and sort of mm -hmm. trying to get a better understanding about what's happening with the crew um, mm -hmm. uh, Beaujolais at this mm -hmm. moment. A couple of nights before that, we're drinking um, Spanish Tempranillo, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of looking up the empty bottles up there. Then there's Rioja, again, looking at uh, Spanish uh, Tempino. We drink pretty widely. I, I often buy stuff more around the world trying to see what's going on and what's contemporary around, around the world. Chianti, love San Giovese. So Chianti is another thing which drinks um, or gets a pretty good air, airing in the uh, in the household. And um, I hate to be a bastard, but right on the table there is my allocation of um, Pierre of Colomare white burgundies. Um, yeah, what, what, <laughs> what, are you, what are you drinking out of the PYCM stuff? Oh, it's a bit of a, a bit of a range there. We get to get some of the Bourgogne, um, and then uh, I think there's a few Merceaux, maybe a uh, Pliny or, 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 or two of the um, on the Premier Crew section. Grand Crews are all allocated. Get, get, no get, no get, back time, I was <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're made with unobtainium, so we can't even buy them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of our good friends, Gavin Lennard, actually works for um, the importer and um, I'm probably lucky to get any at all. Just Gavin goes, give me an order today. <laughs> yeah. So we do love white burgundy as well. And then Chardonnay, um, and again, it could be a theme for another tasting. Is a Chardonnay that we make I'm very, very proud of. And um, Chardonnay, I 
I'm often quoted as saying is the variety I love the most in the white wine world and it's the variety I hate the most as well. Um, so when you see great Chardonnay, it is amazing. When you see poor Chardonnay, it is absolutely gross. Um, so Chardonnay is something I absolutely love. And the great news is for us in Australia is we're making fantastic Chardonnay in Australia now as well. Adelaide Hills, Mornington, Yarra, WA, across the, across the spectrum. The Chardonnay in Australia is just so good at the moment. So um, get out there and start buying Chardonnay. If you think it's grandma's wine, you're missing out. <laughs> yes. Chardonnay is absolutely sensational. Yeah, it's definitely um, changed. Yeah. The new way we're doing Australia yeah. now is the styles changed compared to how it was yeah. for, uh, sort of uh, 1990s and then into early 2000s. What we're doing in Australia now is so much smarter, sophisticated and gorgeous. Mm. So, um, great variety to look out for in Australia at the moment. It used to be anything but Chardonnay was the um, or catch card- cry. Chardonnay. Or Chardonnay. <laughs> Chardonnay, yeah. Yeah, but it's uh, what's happening now is, is, is just gorgeous. Mm. So uh, we should be very, very proud of what's going on in the Chardonnay community in Australia. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've been actually been lucky enough to be able to sell both your Pinot and Chardonnay here in the past um, and have in the shop. And, and yeah, like I said, they, they don't stay on the shelf long. So <laughs> yeah, I just saw a <laughs> little um, catch cry that any now it's anything but Sauvignon Blanc, <laughs> which again, it's... Um, it's that pendulum swing. Mm. We're now starting to go too far against Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc has its place and really, really well-crafted Sauvignon Blanc is still a gorgeous thing. It's just that uh, we've seen too much supermarket quality Sauvignon Blanc in Australia and uh, the really good producers are still making fantastic Sauvignon. So um, keep in mind that small producers, quality-focused producers will still make really, really good Sauvignon Blanc. It's not, yeah, not so much the cut grass and tropical fruit that we're all yeah. used to. It's sort of it's controlling. And, the, and 9.99 right. at your local supermarket. It's, yeah, it's, and, you know, it's still yeah. it's still a good good quality grape variety, yeah. but it just has to be treated with some respect. Yeah. yeah. Do you take a um, do you take a European approach to your SB? Um, yeah, absolutely. That's um, um, as what we do with our raisin and chardonnay. It's a natural yeast ferment. It's all done in barrels, so. We, uh, I guess we make what's traditionally called a Fumé Blanc style and we, um, time and oak varies depending on vintage and generally it's about somewhere between four and seven months oak maturation in French oak. Sometimes it sees a little bit of new oak and then in, into bottle unfined and unfiltered. So it's a pretty traditional European style of uh, Sauvignon Blanc and um, we're, we're really happy with the way it looks. It's um, what we sort of, when we're at Celador and... Um, We've got an audience tonight, I shouldn't say. It's what we call Sauvignon Blanc for grown-ups. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's just quite funny, though. The amount of people, like, if I give it to them blind in Celador and don't tell them what it is, they'll go, is that Chardonnay? Mm. No. no. <laughs> yeah. A number of people say, I don't it's, drink Sauvignon Blanc. Try yeah. it. I don't drink Sauvignon Blanc. Just try it. It's the same I don't drink Sauvignon, Chardonnay, Sauvignon yeah. Blanc. Just try it. <laughs> can I buy that? Yes, you can. <laughs> it's just a matter of um, a lot of... A lot of consumers in the marketplace haven't been exposed to Sauvignon Blanc handled really, really well. And mm-hmm. again, a lot of the Australian uh, uh, wine production uh, community now is, is handling Sauvignon Blanc with a lot of sensitivity yeah, and doing really, really good things with the variety. Mm-hmm. So it's just a matter of go exploring, try new Sauvignon Blancs, try new Chardonnay. There's, there's a lot out there to uh, experience, explore and, and discover. Yeah, yeah there's, there's plenty out there, that's for sure. Um, well... <laughs> I we've well and truly blown the hour mark out of the water, okay. <laughs> which is which is good. Right. I was, like I said, it was, it was one of my uh, one of the ones I've been looking forward to the most uh, in the yeah. past few weeks. So um, I just have to say a massive thank you both Dwayne and Rebecca uh, for, yeah. for for, for sharing not only your amazing wines but also uh, a wealth uh, a wealth of knowledge tonight. It's been fantastic. It's been, it's been fun. Thank you. Thank hope, you. Thank hope, you to everybody as well. Hope the, uh, so. those, those watching and listening have uh, learned a few things and hopefully you're not, not too technical. I'm always aware I just did. I've been technical. <laughs> yeah. It's one of my go-to things. So my apologies <laughs> if I have. 